Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a video that has taken way too long to make. Long ago, in a distant land. I started Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne with the intent to play the game normally and enjoy it like a normal human being. But I got bored and stopped for several years, until the start of this year, when I decided I would attempt the game again and actually complete it this time. However, because challenge runs are all the rage, and I hate myself, I decided to arbitrarily make the game harder on myself in the only way I know how. Can you beat Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne without using any demons? First off, let's set some ground rules. The obvious one is that you are never allowed to use a demon in any way. If I acquire brain hemorrhoids and accidentally use one, the run is completely invalid and I must reload a save. For the purposes of the run, using is defined as dealing damage, taking damage, buffing allies, debuffing enemies, passing a turn, healing HP, healing MP, healing status, repelling enemies, attracting enemies, being the wind on your wings or the light of your life, or doing anything else I have somehow forgotten to mention. In effect, everything must be done using Demifiend and Demifiend alone. There are only a few exceptions which are literally necessary for progress, which I will get into when we get there. The run is officially complete when I beat the final boss and obtain the true demon ending, which I totally intended to get from the start and didn't just so happen to bubblefuck my way into like a doofus. Beyond that, a few additional things that are worth noting before we start. Many of you who have some experience with Nocturne might be recognizing some similarities between this and a very popular, already existing, done many times before challenge run of the game, the Solo Hard TDE Challenge, where you do essentially what I'm doing right now. However, this run will differ in three different ways. The Solo Hard TDE allows the use of demons outside of battle, mostly for the purposes of healing HP or MP, or support skills like Estoma or Liftoma. For the purposes of my run, use of demons in this way is completely banned. The Solo Hard TDE also forbids initiating conversation with demons, only allowing you to bring them into your fold if they beg you for their lives. I don't see why this is a rule. The demon isn't doing anything, you are. So as long as the demon does nothing afterwards besides sit in your backpack and act like a war prize, talking to demons is totally allowed. While not explicitly a rule, every run of the Solo Hard TDE I've ever seen has done so on New Game Plus. This is because of an optional side mission in the Labyrinth of Amala that allows you to refight every boss in the game under a time limit. Should you complete this challenge, you will unlock an item in New Game Plus which gives the Demi Fiend an additional press tone. The issue with that is that would mean I would have to play the game first, and I don't have time for that. When I do challenge runs, unless New Game Plus is explicitly required, New Game Plus is only allowed if you beat the game once within the rules of the challenge, then do it again. So for the purposes of this run, New Game Plus and the extra press tone it provides are completely banned. And in case my last point didn't make it clear, I have never played this game beyond the first visit to Ikebukuro, and when I did it then, I didn't know what Magatama was. So, this run will be almost completely blind. This will handicap me in many ways, so I'll attempt to provide a list of ways that I would actually recommend doing things if you were to do this run yourself. I'll also be playing on normal to compensate for my lack of pre-planning. That being said, we begin the challenge by having a dream about our hot teacher. I decided to name all the characters after my admins on my Discord server, so Yuko will be Inani, Isamu will be the reliable 1999 Ford Taurus, and over here will be Zephyr. We talk to Orlando Bloom in Yoyogi Park, then go to the hospital to meet up with Chiaki and Isamu. Isamu's only there so he can simp for the teacher, so we head to the basement to head him off, only to meet there with Vegeta, who tries to kill us with the power of Satan. Luckily, Mommy Yuko shows up to tell him to stop being a bully and takes us to the roof. She tells us that once shit goes down, to find her and she'll be our strength. Then the world ends! The great disco ball in the sky tells us to find ourselves before we can create the world, but Draco Malfoy gives us demon crabs and robs us for the chance. Luckily, demon STDs give you superpowers in this game, and we walk away with the first Magatama, Maragaria. One quick trip to Legolas later, and we're in the tutorial. Luckily on normal, this is basically impossible to fuck up, and I put my first two points into magic, with the intent to be the best punch wizard since Gandalf. The fight against the Praetor is easy as long as you aren't stupid, and then we get to the only point in the game where I actually recommend you talk to something. A lot of the enemies here are strong enough that they can kill you if you aren't careful, so I actually recommend using talk to get out of fights you don't want to be in, particularly with the Hupo, who, if there are three of them, can basically kill you in one turn. 
once you're about level 7, make sure you grab the Mazio rock in this weird pavilion thing, and it becomes time to punch a fish. Punching fish tends to be difficult, so I recommend you electrocute it first. Touching things that are causing with electricity is a good idea, so punch it for extra damage. Sadly, at this point, we have no way to deal damage to it without sacrificing our own HP, so just beat the meat until the fish is cooked, allowing us to further our insect collection with the ice bug Watatsumi. After successfully executing a kidnapping, we arrive in Shibuya and decide to hit up the club and go cruising for bitches. And to our surprise, we find just vibing in the club with her all jean outfit. Unsatisfied with our lack of bitches, we proceed to court this cat girl by beating her to death like a true gentleman. She keeps trying to charm us, so I assume it worked. After that, Will Turner wants to send us to Ginza through the power of the magic internet, so we pick up Shiranui and Iomante from the store. I'm gonna hard recommend you avoid grabbing anti-fire from Shiranui, as well as any of the debuff skills off of Iomante. They're very good, don't get me wrong, however they're ideal for late game bosses. Thankfully, I'm stupid, so you get to see me struggle boss my way through this nonsense. After this, we promptly head into Amala. I'm gonna level with you all. Running headlong into Amala like I did was a stupid idea. You can't leave Amala once you enter, so if you're particularly underleveled, you could find yourself needing insane luck just to get by in basic battles. It's not too difficult, this is still early level shit, but if you go in too early, you can definitely get burned. Especially in the first fight that gave me a degree of trouble, the first Spectre fight. Spectre can actually prove difficult if you aren't ready for him. Each individual Spectre has a decent amount of HP for your level, and if you don't down at least one of them in three turns, all six fuse into one Mega Spectre that can output massive damage. Since they resist all forms of magic, killing all the Spectres during those three turns is basically impossible. Thankfully, all you gotta do is down one. Removing one Spectre from the fight means the fusion is significantly less powerful, giving us an immediate advantage. Leaving this fight, I now had knowledge of the Glorious Fizz build Master Race, so I began power leveling strength in the hopes that it would make Yuko love me. After escaping the Amala network and doing some requisite waffling, we decided to head from Ginza across the desert to an abandoned warehouse that leads into the sewers where the mud people live. We learn that they're hiding from the mantra, and promptly give next to no fucks about their situation. I recommend stopping by the store here and buying all the mega tumors you can. All of them are fantastic. Ankh gives you some good early game healing, and the only healing magic we're going to be getting for a while. Kamudo gives you some fantastic early game physical stuff, as well as the best skill for a physical build ever. And Hifumi gives you some really solid early game damage skills, as well as force immunity. We're almost ready for the fun to begin, but before this nerd will let us go, we need to give him a bill. Despite us maintaining the pants we came in with, apparently we keep our wallet in our jacket, which somehow vanished when the world ended, so we have to commit some casual B&E in Loki's room. This puts us face to face with a troll. Fun fact, he's extremely susceptible to mind spells, like Charm, so if you happen to find yourself with a wagtail plume, here's a good spot to use it. That said, Punching Fools is basically just as effective, which is the option I go for, as I lack Charm, but have Fist in spades. This is nice, because before we can even get any further towards Ikebukuro, we get pulled into the dead zone to have an honorable 1v1 with Manador for our Magic Hanukkah doodad. To the surprise of everyone, I'm sure, this boss, who is known for being extremely hard, is extremely hard. He consistently opens up with Red Capote, which maxes out his agility, can use Focus to make his sword attacks do increased damage, can decrease your defense with Taunt, and can blow you away with his Bazan attacks. Luckily, Manador is a skeleton, and skeletons are dumb. After a bit of power leveling and a lot of failed attempts, I finally grabbed the counter skill off of Maragaria and replaced Sukunda with Frog Breath, which is just Sukunda but two. You could say it's Sutunda, but you shouldn't. After that, I enter again with Hifumi equipped, and things go much better. Hifumi providing Null to one of Matador's two attacking types turns half of his turns into freebies, and Counter allows me to take my turn in the middle of his turn like a dirty cheater. In addition, Matador will always cast Red Capote again if he starts his turn with a less than plus one to his agility, so reducing it even to plus two with Frog Breath will help considerably. Beyond that, focus on surviving, make attacks when you can, and keep laying on damage. Eventually, Matador will go down, and you're on your way to Ikebukuro. Psych! I lied to you! We decided to pit stop in Hell to complete the first Kalpa of the Labyrinth of Amala. This is not required for completion, but it is required for the TDE, so we may as well. While down here, we do successfully manage to level up enough to grab Focus, which will be a skill we take to the end game. Being able to multiply our next physical hit by 250% for 5 MP is just too good to pass up. 
After our tongue lashing from Metatron, we head back upstairs, take the terminal, and after a short walk, finally arrive back in Ikebukuro. We're going in completely blind from here on, boys. Strap in. So we get arrested for existing, and we have to partake in a trial by combat. Orthus and Yakshini are pushovers since we have the Mega Tacos to block out the scary elemental attacks, but Thor won't go down so easy. He uses a combination of physical and electric moves, the latter of which can really get you since he has heavy damage skills. And since Thor himself drops the first magic table that imparts electric immunity, we get Thanos a couple of times before heading out to grind. We come back, phase resist on the ready, and admittedly get pretty lucky dodging Zeodines and not getting crit, so we're able to bring him down. Unfortunately, we are immediately accosted by a meme who proceeds to one-tone us. I'll give you 10 minutes to decide. Which would you rather end up in? A coffin or a dumpster? E and I... Oh, Ebony and Ivory. That's a physical attack? Jesus! Christmas! Yeah, this would happen several times, since Dante just bends us over backwards and uses our body as a sword sheath. I'm not gonna lie, this fight is rough. Kamudo is absolutely a requirement here for the Fizz Resist alone. Otherwise, Dante's weakest hits would take off a third of my health. That being said, Kamudo makes you susceptible to the Panic Chance effect from Bullet Time, so you gotta pray he just doesn't use that. In addition, that's not even saying you'll survive anyway because of how high Dante's crit chance is. The real kicker here is Rebellion. It hits harder than his basic attack, is completely undodgeable, and has an increased crit chance. Counter is a godsend for this fight. Simply being able to strike him while you focus on staying alive is invaluable. Especially once you get about halfway through the fight and he starts using Provoke. The extra damage is nice, but now he can just kill you by getting one lucky critical hit. This fight is definitely doable, it just comes down to a bit of grinding, some skill, and a lot of luck. Daisojo was, at first, difficult for me because I'm a brain dead enchilada and forgot I had fog breath. I ended up bailing on this fight, but if you walk in and dump his accuracy, you'll be fine. If you take in any other debuff skills, go for those too. He's the only fiend who lacks Dekunda or Dekaja, so he'll just sit there and watch you turn him into a useless poopy diaper baby. After you defeat Dai Sojo, go tell Gozu Tenno his head looks like he dipped it into a tomato truck, then march on down to the assembly of Nilo to party with the other demons what I personally describe as one of the coolest dungeons in the game, riddled with a series of fights that can only be described as tedium. The first Elagor fight can be disappointing because of the dismal lackeys trying to get you stoned, but the Diz doing Diz can be dispelled by muting them with Maka Jam Rocks, so break them, then burn down their baby daddy before making the Diz disappear. The second Elagor fight, he summons Yaka instead. He summons demons that are weak to the same thing he is. Use Mazio rocks and laugh. The third Elagor fight has him compensate by summoning Incubus. They can be annoying with their evil gaze attack since it reduces you to 1 HP, but if you've been red maging like me, you'll probably have picked up Tornado by this point. You're almost guaranteed to hit something, and that something has a 2 in 3 chance to get you an extra turn. Spam Tornado and slap Elagor around when you're not. The fourth fight, he summons any combination of the above three minions. Bully the Yaka, nuke the Incubus, mute the Diz, destroy Elagor. Finally, we get a fight against the cooler Elagor, who summons his bitches. The hoes will try and knock you out, but as long as you wear your Eomante brand Thought Be Gone, you can more or less handle them while you focus down Berith. Somehow, we still aren't done with this fucking dungeon, and now we have to find Patrick Starr and his retarded cousins. After finally picking the right goddamn door, we fight the Kaiwan. They like to cast Mudo spells, and there ain't much we can really do about that, but the Demi Fiend has an inherent 50% resistance to all instant kills. We don't have expel attacks yet, and they resist magic, so just keep punching and the mini boss rush will eventually be over. We get to the final boss of the dungeon, commanded by Hikawa, who throws Cheetah Man at us. The Oze actually has the same strategy we do. He can actually be kind of difficult if he favors Tetracon, but he doesn't usually remove debuffs that you put on him. Load up on Fog Breath, buff when you can if you took any, focus up, and keep fucking swinging. This fight took me more tries than I'd like to admit, but eventually you'll prove society wrong and show that with enough effort, you can punch your way out of literally every problem. Especially if that problem runs out of MP in the middle of the fight. Insufficient MP. 
Holy shit. I boned him out. <laughs> Holy shit. Remember this moment, it'll be important later. After we prove ourselves the king of the muscles, Hikawa pisses on Ikebukuro, and we go back to rubberneck the fallout. After everyone drowns in the yellow piss fort, we walk right on past and sneak out of Ikebukuro. Unfortunately, Nicolas Cage has an issue with us leaving the magical realm, and we have to fight him. Non-copyright infringing Ghost Rider is immune to all of our best magics in fire and force, and can remove all buffs by putting bug spray in our face. And that's about it. He's mostly just good for trying to do donuts and wheelies at us. Hellburner is heavy fire to everyone, but it somehow does less damage than the medium force Hell Exhaust. Hellspin is weaker than his basic attack, but is all target, which for us means it's one target, which just means it's worse. Plus, if you resist this attack, it'll do about 32 to 31 damage apiece. Dump his accuracy with Fog Breath if you want, but really, with Fizz Resist, Counter, and Focus, you can more or less just tank this fight. After committing vehicular manslaughter, we head to Kabukicho Prison to turn ourselves in, but unfortunately the prison has been taken over by freeloaders, so we decide to commit a jailbreak instead. After failing to understand how the dungeon works for about two hours solid, we manage to make our way to professional prison guard Helix Snake, who challenges us to a fight. This fight is literally a fancy version of a normal enemy in the same dungeon. The only thing that he has is a fancy spell called Mirage, which does mediocre mind damage and can give you the heebie-jeebies. You have two options for this fight. If you value money more than your life, take Mind Null. If you like watching him squirm as he fails to do anything to you, take Ice Null. Show him your mixtape, then talk to the Mud Men. Dirt Gandhi tells us to go talk to Peter Drinkwater, and then we get told to fuck ourselves by a car. During my run, this is actually the point where I beat Daisojo, so at this point I go down to the second Kalpa. We forced our way through the realm of Purple Drank, got our ass kicked, then released the Backstreet Boys from their eternal slumber. This turned out to be a stupid idea, as it meant I had to fight the first one as soon as I rolled up in Asakusa 20 minutes later. But luckily, White Riders spawns next to the Everything to Fuck White Riders shop. S seriously, save your pennies, buy Kihena, then roll up on his ass. I hope you kept Tornado, because it's what turned this fight from an actual encounter into a goddamn joke. White Rider's main abilities are God's Bow, which instantly kills you with expel damage, and Prominence, the strongest fire attack in the game that now just heals us and forces him to adopt the thumb twiddling strategy. Probably to help with this, he summons two backup dancers to shore up his awful moveset. The two things that save the day here are the fact that he just never chooses to use his instant win, and nobody in this entire party thought to pack a debuff remover today. Following this, we take on the three little Odies. This little Oni made his house out of force. This little Oni made his house out of ice. This little Oni made his house out of physical- Okay, that one may take some prep. So we head back to Asakusa and play the Puzzle Boy minigame for almost three hours. There's no joke here. I could write one, but just re-watching the footage while writing this script made me so mad I don't care anymore. It's literally required to get the best Magatama in the game, which gives you the best healing spells. Who the fuck did this and why? After Kinky forgets the safe word some more, we head back to the battle tower to beat some Pokemon to death with our bare hands. After we fuck with the moon more than Majora's Mask, we make our way to the top of the tower where we fight Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos. We then fight them again, because I wasn't aware I had to do all of this in one moon cycle, and they feel like being picky. At which point, we're hit with the game's first major roadblock, where you have to fight all three of them at the same time. Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup over here will fuck you up more than Cartoon Network fucked them. Atropos is the caster. She's medium damage versions of every single element. Clotho is the healer. She'll basically heal and heal and heal some more, unless everyone else is already at full health. She can also remove debuffs on them with Dekunda. Lachesis is the buffer. She'll debuff your defense, buff their defense, and buff their magic just to make sure you have the worst day possible. She can also erect Tetracon or Makarakon to prevent you from doing anything you want to do. With only one press turn, this is all but impossible at the level I'm at. None of them have any weaknesses to take advantage of, so it's impossible to keep putting damage on the board while also healing yourself and removing the buffs they put on themselves. And you have to remove the buffs they put on themselves, because if they get more than one or two defense buffs, your damage output will dip so low that they can heal it off faster than you can dish it out. The same applies for magic, since Clotho's healing is tied to her magic stat. Once you do enough damage to one of them to make her start casting Diorama or Mediorama, if they have any buffs on them, it's over. All the while, you have to contend with healing off the damage that Atropos is doing. At the end of the day, it was simply not happening. And we don't have any buffing skills yet, because we get the mozzarella that gives us buffs from this exact fight. 
I had to do something no challenge runner ever likes to do. Something forbidden, except by only the most determined, the most dangerous. Something that would threaten my very life. I had to get good. I did the math and found out exactly what skills I would need to obtain, and didn't just look at a video of what someone else did. As it turned out, I was a bit retarded with my leveling, and burned out some skills that I really could have stood to grab. Particularly Void Fire and Void Ice. Luckily I still had the Drain versions of those elements, so I changed my moveset to work around that. I also picked up Force Boost because I was still struggling with the Jolly Gold Giant, and he takes more damage from magic. This would be my first grinding session of many. It paid off! I was able to take down Goldilocks by dropping several tornadoes on his spiky face. Unfortunately, beating him unlocks a fight against the Batman himself, and as all Batman fans are aware, it's easiest to fight Batman during a full moon. He's like a werewolf, but not. Rather than spend an entire five hours getting beaten up by another Oni, I dipped to go beat up some hoes for stress relief. I didn't bring Electric Null, mostly because I didn't feel like it. Thankfully, this meant that the only one who even dealt damage could only hit me with one element, and if she did anything else to me, their entire turn was wasted. As such, I was able to vigorously pound Clotho with physical attacks. Kamehameha! We got her! Yeah, th that's a physical attack. Without the heal of this fight goes from remotely worrisome to a complete joke. In due time, Laxis goes down, and Atropos soon follows, unlocking the Jed mashed potato. And as everyone knows, mashed potatoes make you stronger. I wrote this joke days ago and scripting this and coming back to it, I think it was because Jed gives you nothing but buffs, attack buff, agility, defense buff, and the ability to remove buffs on enemies. Whatever. Anyway, Inani becomes an SCP, and then we head to the sewers to lose miserably to Little Hood Riding Red Rider. I then travel to 4chan to defeat some internet trolls. The Spectres will try and souk your magic, but you can defeat them by not having any. Sadly, Fort spent a little bit too much time in the internet, and decided to make his reason that in his world, everyone will get a world, which is totally cheating! Not long after that, we head back to Ikebukuro, where Vegeta tells us about how his reason will involve becoming the god of Widow's Peaks. Sadly, he spent the entire game so far being a dick, so we tell him to pound sand. Following this, Futomimi tells us that shit is going down in Yoyogi Park, so we pit stop the new shop and buy the Sophia and Vimana Makatama, which will come in handy when Inani tells us to get the Yahi... The Yaha... The Yamaha... Fuck it. When Inani tells us to get the Beefaroni. Anyway, this is an area involves pixies giving you the runaround the entire time, and it genuinely made me want to die. I recommend recruiting Oberon at this point. There's no reason. I just think he looks cool. After going through the Pixie's Warehouse of Wonders, we make our way to Sakahagi, who I forgot to mention before this point, but I'm too lazy to go back and rewrite the script. Anyway, he summons Dumbo the Giant Elephant to try and fuck up our day, and for anyone who's ever played an SMT before, you'll know that Gear and Makala completely repels all damage from physical attacks. This meant that my entire build is useless. Luckily, I still had Tornado and Force Boost, so I could still put a decent amount of damage into him. It took a bit of doing, but with enough effort, I defeated his summoned devil. Sakahagi, despondent that we murdered his pet, challenges us to a 1v1. Unfortunately, he did not commit the No Demon Challenge, and we have to DQ him. Fun fact, this is not a murder, as murder only applies to humans, and the game repeatedly tells me that mannequins aren't human. After receiving some irrelevant exposition from Oberon about how Zephyr or Chiaki or whoever is fusing with a demigod to obtain ultimate power, I swapped to Jed so I could obtain Tarukaja. I did not realize how valuable buff skills would be for this challenge towards the end of the run, and I should not have done this. But I did it! I think this is what the kids refer to as a bra moment. That said, this was enough to be able to do a bonus boss in Mara, who gets summoned as a ball of goo due to YouTube's guidelines. Mara's an interesting fight here. He has a few things that can give you a rough time, such as Dismal Tune for Mute, and Hades Blast and Health Thrust for Physical. If you'd have 24 strength, you can grab Gaia from the Mantra HQ's basement, which will make it so you don't get thrusted as hard. It will make you weak to force, which he also has, but the alternative is being weak to ailments, which, god no. His main gimmick, however, is that if he's taken any damage whatsoever, he will fully heal up at the end of the turn. There are two ways to handle this fight. Force him to lose all of his MP over time by making him heal every single turn, or kill him in one shot. Using second grade math, I determined that I could exceed his 2300 HP in a single divine shot if I boosted my physical attack four times, focused, and then got a critical hit. Which thankfully is exactly what happened. After beating my meat into jelly, I left to go commit a hate crime and murder Black Frost. Black Frost is probably the easiest fight in the game. 
He can summon the power of Satan to try and instant kill us or give us the cold shoulder. Beyond that, he has nothing. Pick ice or death immunity, or if you still have void or drain ice, both, and go watch him embarrass himself. The only issue with this fight is that he has immunity or better to damn near fucking every element in the game. Physical hits do 10% damage, fire, death, and ailments get reflected back at you, he heals off of ice, and expel does nothing. Force boosted tornado makes the fight less of a pain in the ass, but not by a lot. After he's been removed from the planet though, he gives you the power of Satan. Nice. Following this, the 1999 Ford Taurus pulls a drive-by on Hijiri's ass and kidnaps him. We go in and he invites us to tea. However, before we go, we must defeat the Spectre one final time. And this fight sucks. Allow me to tell you why. The dev intended script for this fight involves the Spectres blowing themselves up and trying to kill you. This suicide bombing is almighty damage, but they're immune to this because fuck you. This would be fine, but they can also summon more of themselves. This prevents the strategy of debuffing them so they can't do anything. While there are three or four of them, it's entirely possible for them to bring in enough special forces to effectively reset the fight. This ability costs no MP, by the way, so they can do this as much as they want. This fight is entirely up to luck. Debuffs are useless. It's actually a good thing I still had Tarukaja here, because the plus four attack was the only thing that made this possible, as I can now one-shot a Spectre with Divine Shot unfocused. This didn't make it easy, though. The only way I could consistently progress the fight was to get a crit, giving me a second action during my turn. If I didn't, the odds that they would simply summon another one was simply too high. This fight lasts as long as Todd Howard decides it does. Your skill and effort is not a factor. Pray to you and hope God gives you good RNG. After this, we make it to the Amala Temple, where Ford tells us he never invited us to tea. What the fuck? All we need to do is take on three temples. All of these temples were very clearly designed by someone who hates fun, which is awesome. After we get to the end of the Black Temple, we face Asiel, who takes the award for most annoying boss so far. Asiel has two combos. The first is where he casts Dragon's Eye that proceeds to rail you with Mana Drain four times. Immediately following this, he proceeds to cast Soul N*** Black Sun, which is an unavoidable attack that puts you to 1 HP. He follows this up with an attack most of the time, so you basically just have to hope he misses you. I'm simply not doing enough damage at this point, and while I could reduce his damage with physical resist, Soul Nigeria was simply too much. So I left, and found this giant jelly bean gang instead. Elbion has a simple gimmick. If you destroy him, he gets revived by his buddies. If you destroy his buddies, he revives them. You must finish the buddies and Albion himself in the same turn. Thankfully this wasn't too hard. His backup dancers provide plenty of elemental coverage, so just bring physical resistance to deal with the big Chungus' attacks. Kamudo if you don't want to be weak to an element, Gaia if you don't want to get hit with status. Slowly defeat all of the minions except for the one whose weakness you can exploit, then whittle down its 1300 HP so you can kill it in one shot. After that, whittle down Albion's 2700 HP until you can do the same. Use a weakness to kill the small one, fire away at the big one, and watch the jelly men fall, giving you the Magatama Adama. Adama is rad as hell, because it can teach you Bolt Storm, which calls down the wrath of Odin himself to fuck your enemies to death. If you're stupid like me and have already rocketed past being able to learn Glacial Blast, which is on my asthma, this is a good alternative. If you're not dumb as a sack of hammers, take Glacial Blast instead. It's a special tool that'll help you later. After losing to the Dark Knight and Asiel's demonetization some more, I decided to grind up and attain the best skill in the playthrough, Avenge. Avenge is like counter, except it hits like a fucking train car. After you get this, you never need to remove it. It's that good. I do eventually remove it, but I want you to be better than me. I teach you with my mistakes so you can be better. I'm your dad now. After obtaining Avenge, I'd head back to Asiel and get surprisingly lucky. The game decided it didn't feel like winning today, and hardly went for the Soul Nitro combo early on. He also didn't go for Dragon's Eye before attacking very much, opting to often go with Tempest instead, which has a higher miss chance. I bought attack mirrors from the gem shop in Ginza so we could use Tetracon on a few turns where he'd follow up with Soul Nitro, but we hardly end up using them since he barely went for Soul Nitro. Instead, he mostly just went for physical attacks, which triggered Avenge. He started using the combo later, which made me a bit worried, but we were still able to flip enough coins to take a win. Following this, I pit stop back at the sewers to fight Red Rider again. This time, I go in with Vimana, which gives me immunity to the status off his Terra Blade. I'm also strong enough to take a little bit more of a beating than I could before. 
but most importantly, the powers he summons are weak enough that if I make the coin flip on Avenge, I can instantly kill them, forcing Red Riding Hood to waste a turn summoning more. At that stage, all I need to do is make sure the powers don't buff his attack too much by using the Kasha Stones as necessary, and focus down Red Rider himself before eventually taking the win. I continue my crusade to wrangle up them there riding boys by heading to the hospital to Moto Black Rider. Black Rider could have been difficult, as he has Soul Divide, which cuts your current HP in half, as well as some high damage magic spells and two legions, which will increase his magic, but to be honest, he went for so many physical attacks that I was able to just blast him down with focused divine shots. I don't even remember what Magatama I had on, I think it was some form of physical resist, but it doesn't matter. He was that easy and Black Rider and his meatballs fall in one try. As a victory lap, we go to take down a new fiend, Mommy Harlot, who attempts to make kissy faces at us. I, I think. Mother Dearest is a pain in the ass, because she's another boss designed by people who hate fun. She reflects physical, so my main strategy is out. Her electric moves aren't that dangerous, but she also cancels electric as well, which leaves us only able to damage her with Tornado. And when she can heal herself for 500 with Beast Roar, the end result is you not dealing a lot of damage at all. I decide to table this fight for now and go fight Pale Rider instead, but sadly the final rider proves to be harder than writing this script. He summons the logo from Skeleton Warriors, who take the cake for the most annoying shit-ass ads ever. They can hit you with sleep, poison, stone, instant death, or worst of all, debilitate. As I said before, we have no way to remove debuffs on ourselves, so this is just a permanent accuracy evasion debuff. And if you do enough damage to them, they'll just fucking kill themselves with last resort, which is a shitload of damage to everyone on the field, except Pale Rider, who heals from this very specific form of almighty damage. Because game mechanics don't mean anything in this game. Only you have to follow the rules, you s stupid rule follower. In addition, Pale Rider also has Pestilence, which deals almighty damage and instant kills you if you've been poisoned. He also has Eternal Arrest, which instant kills you if you've been put to sleep. In short, never get hit by status ever. That's the strategy, just don't get grabbed, stupid. Wanting to go back to the land of mechanics that make sense, I return for one final attempt at Onkyoki, who can make copies of himself and attack four times. You can only see which one is the real one if you fight him during the full moon. Full disclosure, I actually kind of love this boss, I'm just mad. Thankfully we get extremely lucky, and he triggers Avenge enough times that we can burn him down, unlocking another Magnet Tumor, Murakumo. This might just seem like a worse version of every Fizz Resist Magatama we have so far, and you'd be right. But only being weak to Fire and Ice does have one use we'll get to later. Author's note, I have no idea how we're only at the third caliber by now. I wasn't personally aware I spent this much time waffling, but we're finally here, and this is where shit gets messy. Dante from the Devil May Cry series is back, and he wants to play tag. Eventually he gets bored of this, and it escalates to Australian motor tag. It's like tag, but motor is legal. It's a good thing we've been specking into motor for 70 levels, so we successfully beat the poopy out of him. We then get killed by random encounters, and have to do the fight all over again. This time, however, Dante actually decides to try. If you're struggling with this fight, I actually recommend using Murakumo. Dante only has Electric and Force Elemental skills, so it's just a free Fizz Resist. Alternatively, Kamuto is also fine, but just beware of his Bullet Time skill. Regardless, Dante isn't a super difficult fight, and with enough effort, you'll bring him down quickly enough. Afterwards, I grind up a little bit more and grab Void Death to try Pale Rider again, pairing it with Gaia to resist physical without any downside. Coming in with Eomante for Void Mind is also a good strategy to cancel most of his status, but I still elect it for the damage immunity instead. None of these guys have Dekunda, so you can debuff their evasion with Fog Breath all you want. Just remember that if you get hit with too much Debilitate, you'll effectively be back to square one. After that, focus on focus, and shoot him down. Evasion's the name of the game here. The fewer Debilitates you get on you and the more misses they get, the better. The game decides to take pity on me, and I only take three Debilitates throughout the entire fight allowing me to take out Pale Rider. His buddy tries to go down with a ship, but I had just enough HP to stand my ground. Heading back to the actual game now, putting the horror on hold, we go to take on Scotty, who is the final boss of the Amala Temples. Scotty heals from physical damage, because God hates me. She has four things she can do throughout the fight. Buff attack or defense, attack with earthquake, have your HP with thunderclap, or use Mazandine. Mazandine is great, because her magic is significantly weaker than her strength. Beyond that, all you need to worry about is Earthquake and Thunderclap. Earthquake is extremely dangerous, so the devs made sure she doesn't use it too much. 
Coming with physical resistance might seem smart, but Thunderclap, which she uses a lot more, can put you in a bad way if she spams it. It's much easier to just make sure she doesn't buff up too much by throwing no U rocks at her than tanking the Earthquake like a man. When she uses Thunderclap, it'll cost her turns as long as you brought in Void X Spell, so you'll be able to slowly whittle her down with whatever magic attacks you have until you eventually pull out a win. After unlocking the innermost part of the Temple of the Greybeards, Ford throws Orlando Bloom into the Vat of Kool-Aid in order to summon Moby Dick, and promptly fucks off. The angels show up to exposit to me about how he is about to commit genocide against the mud people, so we go to their holy land via Sakusa to educate Zephyr about the importance of properly delivering exposition. Now here's the big part where I goofed up story-wise and could have benefited from knowing what I was doing. If you want to have the easiest time playing like an idiot, I highly recommend simping Chiaki. The TDE takes precedence over all other endings, so as long as you've defeated all the fiends and completed Lucifer's basement by the time you enter the Tower of Catgirl Sushi, you're fine. Thus, it's okay to sign on to a given ending, and I highly recommend doing so here. Pretending to take Zephyr's ending here prompts a fight with Zenyatta, whereas not doing so forces you to fight the Archangels of literal fucking heaven. I'm sure you can figure out which is the easier fight. Thankfully, it's not like the Archangels of literal fucking heaven are a difficult fight anyway. They resist all magic, sure, but physical works just fine. That said, Raphael does decide to throw up Tetracons like a dick, whereas Uriel provides turns with Beast Eye, and Gabriel wastes them doing nothing, since her magic attacks don't do much damage, save for the one that halves your HP. Whether you want to take out Uriel or Raphael first depends upon whether or not you want to kill the healer or stop the shields. I personally chose to stop the shields because not being able to use my build makes me want to scream. Thinking about how I was going to approach Mother Harlot, it was at this point where I had a stupid idea. Like, Really stupid. Supremely stupid. Unlike most games, this game actually does keep track of the enemy's MP. This means that enemies can run out of MP, and at the time of fighting Mother Harlot, I wasn't really able to do enough damage to outlast her Beast Roar technique, which heals her for 500 every time. That being said, she really couldn't do enough to hurt me either. Her physical attacks were never good enough to kill, even with focus, and the game gives you a Repel Electric Magatama. I'm confident there's a being good at video game strategy here, but sometimes, the best strategy is to just sit down, keep yourself healed, and wait 30 minutes for the enemy to use its high cost skills until it can't do anything but sit skill to death. Following this, we are put face to face with Trumpeter. You know what, we're, we're, we're gonna try to ignore him. I will, I will not stay here. HELL YEAH! After promptly running away from Trumpeter, we arrive at Trump Tower, and have to fight Fire Sword McGee over here. Sirt is actually an interesting demon, since his basic attack is actually part fire. He also has some of the most high damage fire skills in the game, spells capable of one-shotting you on hard mode. As such, we wear our flame retarded underwear, and Sirt just kind of gives up because we put on Gehenna. Following this, we go to fight Mata, only to find ourselves unable to do much damage. Meanwhile, Trumpeter completely bodies us in four turns when we go back and try. As such, we leave to go do some prep work. We beat up Samurai Jack and he gives us a gun. Using this gun, we can fire off blasts of wind as well as lasers from our eyes. We also make sure to pick up the Endure ability off of Vimana. Thankfully, these are enough to make Mata easy. The Ansi Summon can be neutered with Maka Jam Stones, allowing you to focus on wind cutting Mata to death. I recommend Iomante to prevent you from being intoxicated. And then there is Moat who is as easy as the game decides to make him. There's not really much you can do here unless the game decides to be nice. Moat is one of the only enemies who's programmed to be able to use Beast Eye multiple times in a turn. However, his AI isn't that great, and he might use those turns fruitlessly buffing magic, even if it's already capped. On hard, this can mean your death if he decides to follow up with a Meki Dolon, but on normal, it only maybe means your death. Just spam Bolt Storm until the game decides to let you win. The last thing between us and Vegeta is Mithra. Mithra's gimmick to fighting you is trying his hardest to cheat. He always uses Dragon Eye and does nothing but spam instant kills. Thankfully, instant kills still need to hit in order to roll their odds, so use Fog Breath to dump his accuracy. He only has 4500 HP, so focus and spam Unibeams as he keeps rolling for instant kills rather than actually dealing any damage. After this, we finally enter Hikawa's Tilta Whirl, and we tell him we're simping our teacher today. As such, Vegeta decides to summon Slifer, the executive producer, in attack mode. He tries to play deck traps on us to prevent us from playing any cards or to heal ourselves, but really we go in with a strategy that largely involves beating the shit out of him with our dual disc. 
which is how I win most Yu-Gi-Oh duels. Anyway, so our mommy gives us the Millennium Puzzle and tells us to change the world before saying goodbye. And then we proceed to go die to Trumpeter. 156 times in a row. Seriously, this fight took me 8 hours in and of itself, not counting the literal weeks of grinding I did to prepare for it. I was level 102 by the end of it all. This is the biggest luck check in the entire game. I ended up bringing Adama for the Electric Repel since he seems to favor my Zeodyne, although he does have Mazandine, so that could have easily backfired. Really, any Magatama works here, it doesn't change how much you'll die. I recommend dumping his accuracy with two Fog Breaths to give yourself the best odds of a dodge, and then going in with Focus Spiral Viper. After he drops you to 1 HP with Evil Melody, you're going to need to heal, which is just a wasted turn no matter which way you slice it. And even then, you need 3 crits after that on those Spiral Vipers you're throwing out, or you simply won't have enough time to deal enough damage. This fight is nothing but having the right skills and a shitload of luck. You're backing on multiple crits happening at the right times, while also dodging a follow-up attack after Evil Melody. In addition, you need to make sure that you don't deal too much damage, because after Evil Melody, 4 turns later he uses Holy Melody. And if your HP is a higher percent of your total than his, that Holy Melody will heal him instead of you, which is an instant loss. And there's no way to dodge the second Evil Melody. On turn 12, you lose, full stop. This fight is a game of blackjack, where the dealer is playing Texas Hold'em, and you still need to find a way to beat his hand five times in a row, or he'll shoot you in the face and steal your fucking wallet. Counting cards is not an option here, it is a requirement. Without Endure, you would need to be such a high level that you could four-shot him with crits, which is just not even remotely feasible. This fight is nothing but luck. But, with enough luck, you can eventually do it. Yo, let's just get three crits right now. Let's just get three crits. Right now, let's do it. See? There's one, right there. See? Easy. All you gotta do is believe in yourself really hard. See, I believe in myself right now, and that means this is a going to be a crit. That's two, you see? Right there. All you gotta do, believe in yourself real hard. See? You declare it to be so, and it becomes so. You believe in the light of God so that when you look this man in the eyes and say, this crit is going to be number three. And then this crit is going to be number three. Yes! Fuck! Yes! We did it! Oh my god! God, that felt so good. Following this, we go down to the Lampeth of Amala for one final time to get that shit out of my hair before the end of the game. Up first is the boss of the fourth Kalpa, the Azelbub, whose strategy is so much simpler than Trumpeter's that I'm just going to say it in one sentence. <clears throat> Wear Kersnol or you die. Following this, Dante invites us to his Inferno, and we have to pay him 326,802 Maka for the privilege of having him be our new cheerleader. The fifth Kalpa isn't anything special, we mostly just have to use our demons to open doors. But we do upgrade our Pixie to her ultimate form, and then promptly put her on the bench where she belongs, only to have her open up all the stat-gated doors. And then finally, we are put up against our final battle of the Kalpas, Alan Rickman. The first phase of this fight is not hard. He basically doesn't do anything but use basic physical attacks and spam holy magic like a good white mage. After we deck him enough though, he finally decides to start trying. It's at this stage when he begins casting Tarukaja, Makakaja, and worst off, Debilitate. This presents us with a conundrum. Every Debilitate he puts on us is permanent. Once we hit minus four, we're taking double damage, dealing half damage, and all of his hits are guaranteed. And while you can remove the buffs he puts on himself, you also need to heal yourself to stay alive, and also eventually do damage to him. I'm sure the option exists to win this with the way I have it set up, but god help me if I know what it is. With no options, I resorted to my last resort strategy. Megatron only starts taking things seriously after you deal enough damage. 
meaning so long as you never push him below that threshold, he'll stick to Holy Wrath, Mahamon, Megidolon, and basic attacks. He'll throw out Dekuna if you put debuffs on him, but really that's about it. Without Debilitate and Makakaja, Megidolon isn't that scary, so we can just sit down and wait for him to burn his MP away. Any minute now. Any minute now. Yeah, as it turns out, burning away 10,000 MP takes a lot of time. This fight took an hour and a half. Thankfully, a strategy of stalling prevents it from doing anything to hurt us later on, so we win by default. Following this, Lucifer finally unlocks the Pierce skill for us, and we enter the Tower of Kagatsuchi for the end game. We don't take Pierce quite yet, though. Once we take Pierce, I know we'll never be removing it, so I don't want to make that commitment yet. Instead, we move forward, coming face to face with Vegeta, who is ascended to the god of all hentai. Unable to beat him, we decide to finally start using buffs and pick up Rakukaja and Sukukaja. This gives us the edge we need, but Araman still gives us a rough go of it. Properly timing damage to allow us to skip bad phases of his game when he tells us what we can and can't do will allow us to get to the fight proper. I recommend using this time to buff yourself and debuff him, since he doesn't have access to Dekaja or Dekunda yet. During his second phase, he does gain these skills though, but on the winning run he just decides not to use them until the last second, which allows us to nearly throw the fight before we win. Following this is the fight against Noah, who is mostly completely pathetic. His gimmick is reflecting all damage except for one specific element, which he rotates around as he uses Aurora. He even reduces almighty damage by 90%. This is annoying, but manageable, until he decides to break out the BDSM, which gives him pleasure from our pain. Shocker, when I only have rocks to deal fire and ice damage, and my force and electric damage isn't good enough to outpace him stealing almost 200 HP a turn, I quickly run out of options. Even with Pierce, I can't do anything in this fight, since Pierce doesn't stop Repel. Thankfully, I have one more option. The game gives you the option to ignore Noah entirely, taking the elevator upstairs to the town of JC Pennies, where the mannequins now live. And it's here where the LGBT community blesses us with divine power, Freikugel. Or, as Google tells me it's called, freeballing. After obtaining this power, the Pope gives us a literal divine sword, which we use to go unlock four optional bosses. These are definitely optional, however beating all four gives us the Masakados Magatama, which makes us immune to literally everything but almighty damage. So yeah, we're gonna do that. The gimmick of this area is that we have to level four pillars, and doing so has us fight the four heavenly kings, Blinky, Pinky, Inky, and Bishaman. The Ice and Lightning guys can be defeated with the strategy of equipping the Magatama that cancels their element, putting the game on auto attack, and going to go make a sandwich. But Force Boy will take a little more thought. His strategy involves using Dragon's Eye to buff his defense, lower your defense, and then either throwing out a physical or force attack. After he does this four turns in a row, he'll swap to buffing his magic and then performing three attacks. After a bit of thought though, we figure out a counterplay. Step 1. Wear Gundari. This prevents any of his force moves from working and ends his turn immediately. Step 2. Whenever he casts Rakunda on you, use Rakukaja right back. This removes his debuffs manually over time. Step 3. After he swaps to buffing magic, cast the Dekunda stone once. This removes his defense buffs, and we don't care about his magic buffs anyway, Gundari cancels them. Number 4. Go in. Gundari's ability to absorb force means that all of his force attacks are useless, and his magic buffs are wasted turns and wasted effort. The only thing we need to worry about now is physical damage, which we can negate with Tetracon or just plow through like a champion. And then there's Bishaman. Or I should say, this is when I started fighting Bishaman. We'll get back to him, but over the course of my attempting to fight Bashaman, I went back and beat every single boss besides the final one. To briefly cover everything, Noah was easy once I got Pierce and Freikugel. Since he only resists Almighty, Pierce cancels that entirely, meaning freeballing does full damage. At this point, he can't do anything to stop us. The final reason fight we have is against Cock Dick Balling Avatar, whose gimmick is turning us into a fly. Thankfully, doing so is mind type, so Iomante or Masakados will prevent it entirely. At which point, our only concern is gradually wearing down the adds she summons. Floros can cast buffs, and Oze can remove debuffs and put up shields, so I recommend taking out Oze first. Then Floros, and then watch as Ball Avatar struggles as you wear her down. Finally, we've come face to face with Kakatsuchi, the thing that will shape the new world. And we're gonna make sure that nobody can ever save the world again. Kakatsuchi is actually a neat fight. 
The first phase has the moon changing, which actually alters his defenses independent of buffs and debuffs. At full, his defense is doubled. At new, it's halved. Yamagatama really doesn't matter for this fight. His attacks are part almighty, so resistances don't really matter. When the moon is full, he'll always use Vast Light, which does a large amount of unblockable almighty damage, so I suggest you make sure you're healed for that. As I said, Magatama doesn't matter, but I recommend Iomante to Null Charm in the future. Once the second phase begins is where he shakes things up a bit. His moveset stays mostly the same, though his defense is no longer changed when the moon is changing. In addition, whenever he says a dialogue, he'll always use Infinite Light next turn, a move capable of dropping your HP by a large amount, even with buffs. Again, make sure you're healed, watch your MP, and slowly whittle him down and take your win. You can't kill me. Yeah! God is dead! Or rather, that would be your win. If we didn't do the true demon ending. Instead, Lucy Liu pulls us aside to pat us on the back for destroying all of reality, and offers us a job interview for General of Hell's Assault on God. So we put on our suit, grab our resume, and IMMEDIATELY CHOKE! OH MY GOD! So, let me tell you why Lucifer is knocking butts. Lucifer has an HP of FFFF. What the F does that stand for? Well, in hexadecimal, OXFFFF is equal to 65,535. He also has the same amount of MP in case you thought stalling him out was going to be a strategy today. And he has 75% resistance to everything, including Almighty, because Lucifer don't play by no rules. In addition, Haleal over here has some of the meatiest attacks in the game. Dakunda and Dekaja for buff control, Diorama to heal himself, 40s in every stat, Prominence and Glacial Blast, and Megidolon for good measure. And that's not even his exclusive skills. First on the table is Evil Gleam, a 60% chance against Charm for your entire field. This is actually why I recommend Iomante, because if you get Charmed and fully heal him, lol GG. After you deal enough damage, he starts breaking out High King. Extremely high almighty damage, completely unblockable, and 100% buying chance. And this besides, Lucifer still has a basic attack, which is also part almighty and is also unblockable, which deals over 150 damage with an extremely high crit chance. And he loves to follow up a crit with High King. He can one-shot you at any time with crit High King, crit High King. There is nothing you can do about that. And even if you were to theoretically get past all of that, you have to contend with Root of Evil, or as I like to call it, the Vindictive Dungeon Master. Basically, the game rolls a d10. On a 10, you're poisoned. On a 9, you're muted. On an 8, you're stunned. On a 7 through 4, you lose half your current HP. On a 3 through 2, you lose 75% of your current HP. On a 1, you lose 90%. And yes, he loves to open a turn with this. If you get the 90% roll, you better pray he chooses to use one of his normal spells, because if he uses an unblockable, you lose. If I were to put a spell like this and a boss in my D&D campaign, my players would shoot me. With our current setup, there is nothing we can do. If I had been smart, I might have been able to bring Void Mine as well as Void Nerve, but that doesn't change all of the ice and fire damage he can do, as well as the rest of the ways he can ruin your life. There's only one thing left we can do. You could not live with your own failure. Where did that bring you? Back to me. I'm gonna level with you for a second. Once I started genuinely trying to put attempts into Bashaman, I had already died 727 times over the course of the run, and I was level 127. By the time that I beat him, I was level 255 and died 1,428 times total. I actually died 701 times on this single fight because I did not properly prepare. The Shaman is indisputably the hardest boss of the Demonless run. Yes, even against Lucifer. Even people who have done the standard solo hard TDE challenge with two press tones agree with me on this one. Remember when I said back then that I had accidentally skipped Void Ice and Fire, and I had to take Drain Ice instead? Well, to get Drain Ice, I had to pass on Glacial Blast. Had I known how useful that would have been, I would have taken Glacial Blast instead of Bolt Storm. 
or at least saved it until now. The Shaman is weak to ice, so you can use that to get additional tones off him. But since I didn't have Glacial Blast, or even Ice Breath, I had to make do with Mabufu Stones, which are about as effective as a Spring Breeze. Meanwhile, the Shaman has a new moveset since we last saw him. In fact, the only move he still has from when he gave us a gun is Prominence. He has several different options now, including, but not limited to, using Dragon's Eye to cast Harukaja four times, then splitting your asshole open with a basic attack, using Dragon's Eye to cast Makakaja four times, then nuking you from orbit with Megidolon, casting Megidolon five times if you make yourself immune to both physical and fire, spamming Tempest, which, while weaker than his basic attack, has a very high crit chance, casting Debilitate twice to drop all of your stats, removing your buffs, or just fucking murdering you with a basic attack. The Shaman has so many ways to just end your life, while also having an infinite number of ways to make it so you can't end his. He can't remove debuffs you place on him, but with Debilitate, he can make them may as well not exist. And even if you use Gehenna to make it so all of his fire attacks are useless, unlike Metatron, he has no phases, so there's no hope in starting out a bad phase. If he gets a crit, you're dead. If you null Fizz and Fire, you're dead. If he opens with Debilitate, you're as good as dead. If you do anything wrong at any point whatsoever, or get a bad roll on luck, you're dead. I did this fight long enough to notice patterns in his movement, and began to manipulate his actions to make him cast fire moves for as long as possible, while I did my best to prevent him from buffing up and throwing out attack moves. I tried, and tried, and tried, and tried, and tried. I gave up. That's when I went back to go fight Thor, Ball, Avatar, and Kagatsuchi. I went back, and tried. I considered cheating a win with save states, but that have felt like I failed myself, so I went back and tried. And tried, and tried, and tried. I picked up Retaliate, where I had previously gotten a bit of revenge. And then I tried. But eventually, after grinding for literally weeks and weeks, and hours and hours of trying and grinding and trying and grinding and trying and grinding and trying and grinding, Well, let's just, let's just try going in again. See how that happens. See how that go plays out. I don't think it's gonna go well, but like, you know, maybe. Sixty-six. All right. 98. Okay, we need to skip out of this phase. 73. And a heal. Okay, thank God. I want him in this phase, so let's just do one thing. 24, 48. I'll take that. 69. Ow. 26, 13. I'm fine with this. 72. Tempest. 24, 38. 10,005. I'm fine with this. 72. And a heal. Okay. Oh, okay, I need it. What? So he just prominent stuff, so do we go in? I don't think we go in. I do not I do not feel comfortable going in. However, I will. 67. Good move. Ow. 25-69. Let's try to keep him in this phase. Nice. If you were to completely tap out his MP. Right, yeah. Which would be big funny. I don't even know if that like what would happen under that circumstance. 70. Focus. 
Seventy-five plus one now, Joe's okay. One second, I will get light on that. My heart is a burner, how to sell it. My word of comfort, one plus what gets me go away. Make sure she's in the stack. Take back what the lost do, the boss is so free and fear. Alright. Heal up, Francis. 79 Yes! Fuck! a lot of his turns with fire moves. He didn't use debilitate. He let me heal more often than normal and missed a good number of his physical hits. This is the best possible run I could have gotten. If you want to try this yourself, I recommend grabbing Glacial Blast, keeping Avenge, and if he'll let you, mix Fizz Resist and Drain Fire. But no matter what happens, know this fight will be an absolute pain. But the feeling of success will be incredible. Now with Masakados in hand, I challenged Lucifer once again. Having Null to All But Almighty certainly helped. His fire and ice moves simply end his turn since he doesn't ever increase his turns, and since we're immune to all status conditions, Root of Evil now does nothing 30% of the time. That said, Lucifer is still a bitch and a half. His basic attack can still hit you, and High King is still the nuclear bomb it always was. Not to mention, if you get unlucky with crits or Root of Evil, you can very much still lose. This one nearly broke me, but not because it was hard, just because I almost broke from the Shaman. But with enough perseverance, I pushed through, and with one final Frykugel, successfully defeated Nocturne with one Prestone and no Demons. This run was a monster, as well as writing the script. It took me a while to get into writing scripts, as well as figuring out how to make videos in a style I liked. But with the Nocturne videos I've been posting here, I felt like I finally had a rhythm enough to actually come up and finish this. Kinda like the run, part of me wondered if I would ever actually finish the script. But I did, and now I finally have the ability to say, yes, I did this, here's proof. This is definitely the hardest challenge Nocturne has. One press tone severely limits your options, so much so that normal mode is still very much a challenge. To anyone looking to do this, especially on hard, don't. Just don't. Just do New Game Plus, please. Bind up demons and beat the boss fights in the Mala Network so you can get the second press tone. This run is cruel and a bastard. God damn though if it wasn't rewarding. I still love this game dearly, even after that. This was my first run of the game. I've beaten multiple SMT games demonless, but this was by far the hardest. And it was so fun. I highly recommend giving the solo RTDE a shot. At least on New Game Plus. Anyway, thank you all for watching. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up, and maybe subscribe for more Nocturne. If not, that's fine too. I'm glad you watched anyway. Take it easy guys, and I'll see you next time. Love yous!